Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are super excited, so blessed and grateful to bring you all a very special guest. He really needs no introduction. He's a beautiful soul, Mr. Fire, Mr. Expect Miracles. Anthea, take it away. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Joe Vitali in the house, everybody. So <laughs> exciting. Um, and as you guys all know, we've been um, promoting this, letting you all know that he's here. And um, although he doesn't need an introduction, we're going to go for an introduction anyway, because I just see him to be an absolute superstar. And what he's achieved to me is just amazing. So Dr. Joe Vitali here is a self-help author, a spiritual teacher, helping people awaken to their inner power. And he's certainly done that for us, 100%. Um, he's written over 80 books. I mean, you, know, you can't even fathom that, 80 books, like, wow. Um, been in 27 um, movies, including The Secret that we all know about. And like this group is called, the uh, law of attraction and the secret. So yeah, we all know about the uh, secret and 15 music albums out thus far, hundreds of online products, coaching and mentoring pro products. And one of the things I wanna say is, Mr. Joe, you are loved by so many and have changed, oh. like honestly changed hundreds and thousands of people's lives around the world with the work you do and your consistency and just never giving up. And we find that just, you know, so touching to us and it's such an inspiration to keep us going in life. Um, it's people like yourself that makes a difference to everybody else because we see you go in and go in and go in and just never giving up. So, um, and I definitely know that's what's helped me through my life, knowing that there's a person out there that I can relate to and has made such a difference um, to so many people and I've taken that on board and when I've wanted to give up I've listened to Dr Joe here and I've literally just got back up I said right no not doing this it's time to push myself forward again so um and that's one of the things that I'd absolutely loved about you is that um you know you're an action taker you don't just sit there and wish and think things are going to just come and appear you take that action and like you've said many times um, you would never have written all those books if you had just sat there and done nothing. They would never have written themselves. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So um, you often speak um, about being homeless and, in, and, you know, the time that you was homeless and in poverty. Um, when did you discover the teachings? Well, first of all, I'm catching my breath from that wonderful introduction you just gave. And your heartfelt, sincere acknowledgement of my helping you through my work, that, that touches me. And that's the reason I do it. It's, it's to touch people and help people and to get the confirmation and to get the feedback live right now is not only gratifying, but it's, it's humbling. So I'm thanking you for it and I'm catching my breath after hearing it. So what was your question? Um, <laughs> the question was when um so you've spoken of uh I've lost it as well now I'm getting tears in my eyes <laughs> um so when you've spoken many times about you know being homeless and coming from poverty um <clears throat> to live in an abundant life so when did you discover the teachings well I discovered the teachings when I was a kid I always loved books you can tell by the my background I'm I'm a book holic i love books and i lived in the public library before i can actually buy and afford books but when i was a kid i was reading metaphysical books uh, when i was 15 16 years old i was reading psycho cybernetics and the magic of believing and how to win friends and influence people and the mystic masters of the far east so I was putting my foot in the water, not necessarily understanding what I was reading, but as a kid, as a teenager, I was absorbing it. And yes, I had a dream to be an author, but in my struggle to be an author, there was a long, long, dark, not just a dark night, but dark decades where I was homeless, where I was in poverty, where I was trying to figure things out. And you got to remember we had no internet, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have groups like this. There wasn't any coaching. The only coaching back then was Little League coaching and football coaching. Self-development wasn't anything that I was aware of in terms of reaching for help. 
Plus, at that time, I couldn't have afforded it. So I was doing all this on my own. When I was homeless, I lived in the Dallas Public Library, literally. And it was wonderful because it had books and it had air conditioning and it had a bathroom and it had water. But it was also lousy because I was homeless. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a job. I didn't have people. I didn't have money. And it was there that I really dug in to the psychology and the metaphysics and the philosophy of how we create our lives. And my wake up call really came when I realized that a large part of what I was struggling with was self-created. And it was self-created for no intentional reasons, no conscious reasons. And this is what I want everybody to get. We all have unconscious operating beliefs. And those unconscious operating beliefs are the ones that are causing us to get the major things in our lives. We can sit there like I did, homeless, and say, my intention is to write great material, to write books and plays and comedies and articles and maybe movies. All of that was my intent back then. I wanted to help people. But subconsciously, my intent didn't agree subconsciously, I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't think I was good enough. I had bad beliefs about money, about success, about what it took to be a success. One of the big operating beliefs was I had to struggle. You have to struggle in order to be a successful artist. That was one of the operating beliefs. So really, to answer your question, I've been involved in this since I was a kid, but I didn't really drive it home until I was struggling with homelessness and poverty and dug deep enough to realize most people don't understand that they're creating their lives, they're attracting their lives because of their beliefs, but it's not your conscious beliefs. It's what's in the subconscious slash unconscious mind. And that's where we need to do the work. When I did it, things changed. And how does one know that they've got these unconscious like kind of self-sabotaging beliefs really, isn't it? So how yeah. does one recognize that? What's, what can they recognize in their life to say, okay, this sounds like me. Um, this yeah. is something that I need to do and work on. Well, it's really easy. It's, it's not pleasant, but it's easy. You look around at your life and you realize that everything you have and everything you don't have is stemming from your beliefs. Now, when I first heard this, I was struggling and I thought, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, hmm. I'm making myself unhappy, I'm making myself struggle, I'm making myself cry at night because I am so frustrated and so hungry for success. I'm doing this. It is very difficult to look yourself in the mirror and be ruthlessly honest, but that's what it takes for the transformation. So what I tell people, and it's what I was being told back then through all the books I was reading, that if you want to know what you believe, look at what you have or don't have. For the longest time when I was in poverty, I was living in a room in a house that I could, I mean, the bathroom was in the same room. The TV was in the same room as the bathroom and the bed. This was a room and I barely could afford to be there. And I kept thinking, why would I create this? Why would I create this? And then I would have to go deeper to understand what kind of beliefs might a person believe who's in a situation like this. And then they would start to surface and the beliefs could be everything from, I believe I needed to suffer, or I believed I'm not good enough to be a success. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is good enough for me. Suffer, be virtually homeless, just one step away from it to be in the poverty. Yeah, that's my speed. So when you really look at your situation and go, what kind of person would be unhealthy? What might they believe? What kind of person would be alone when they want to be with somebody? What might they believe? What kind of person would be broke all the time? What might they believe? And what you're looking for are your own operating beliefs. They're in your subconscious mind, but they're not locked away. This isn't a Freudian nightmare that we shove deep within. These are the beliefs, the programming, the wiring that is just below the surface. 
I used to give the example that I can ask a question and the answer is not in your conscious mind right now, but because I asked the question, it'll bubble right up. And all I have to do is say, what's your phone number? Because the average person isn't walking around thinking of their phone number. But it's one level down. You ask the right question. And some of us these days, because cell phones, we don't even know our phone number. But we have to think about it a little bit, and it'll be there. And that's what we have to do with our beliefs. We have to be ruthlessly honest. Now, of course, if you've got a coach or a counselor or a mentor, they can help you find beliefs. And that's why I created the Miracles Coaching Program over 10 years ago because I found that that was a faster way to find beliefs and change them. But to answer your question, we can all do it. It's a matter of looking in the mirror. And I use the word ruthlessly honest, because I don't want anybody to squirm out of it. As you pointed out, it is a form of self-sabotage. And we all do it. We all have blind spots in our behavior and in our programming that we don't really notice until we take a deep, ruthless look or we work with a coach, a counselor, a mentor, somebody who can help us see it. Absolutely. No, I, you know what, I so resonate with what you're saying there, because until I took the um, belief clearing course, uh -huh. I, I thought that I would kind of understood so much, but that really opened my eyes to so much. And the questions I had to ask myself and each, each, each segment of it really made me open my eyes and really made me understand where I was at and why I kept living the same thing over and over again, yes. right? Because like yourself, I experienced homelessness with my two children and oh. I went through it two separate times. And after the first time, and I thought, oh no, I've conquered this. I, I kind of started questioning myself. I started writing, using affirmations, thinking that this will change everything. And actually the affirmations, and now I understand, I didn't actually believe what I was saying. Right. It was it was more deep rooted than that. So when it happened the second time, that's when I said, right, okay, I've certified myself in so many different aspects through your courses, um, but still I'm here. Like, what is it? And it was, you know, <clears throat> I started to understand once I started writing the story out, my new story, what I wanted, um, using the Ho'oponopono, which I absolutely love. Like that one has just, done so much for me in so many different ways um yeah that's when I realized and I and I hear so many people say look how you know they feel stuck or they think that something's changed and they, it hasn't changed so what would you say the, the your your best three top I want to say tips but I want to kind of say steps to finding these beliefs if somebody is in a situation where they don't have the money right now to be mm -hmm. able to take on a coach, um, I know we have <laughs> other things, but if they were going to be at home by themselves and they want to take that time out, what's the, what's the three top things that they can do and implement daily in their lives to actually make a difference to themselves and start realizing these beliefs other than, I know you said looking in the mirror is one of them, but is there anything further than that, deeper than that, that they can go? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've got a bag of tricks, you know, and I'll give you, I'll give you a three, I'll give you a three step formula right now. The very yes. first one is set an intention, state an intention for something you want to have, do or be. This is standard for anybody in law of attraction. This is standard for anybody who watches the movie, The Secret. It's standard for anybody who reads my books. I'm always talking about stating an intention. Lots of great reasons for it. It aligns your body and mind. It sends you in a pinpointed direction. It tells the universe what you want. It, uh, it, it's got a lot of great points for it. But there's something else that takes place that most people don't think about. When you state an intention, and this is the second step, all of the reasons for not attaining it start to bubble up. Mm -hmm. This is how you unearth those limiting negative beliefs. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite examples is in, from my own life, Seven years ago, when I turned 60, I decided I wanted to be a musician. It was on my bucket list. I had played a little guitar, but I said, no, I want to really, I want to go in the studio. I want to write music, record music, sing music, make my own album. I want to be a full-fledged musician and create my first album. There's my intention, right? Great intention. It didn't take more than a few minutes <laughs> for all of the doubt 
all of the second guessing, all of the fear, all of the concern to just start rushing up. And ever everything from, you don't have any musical experience. You've never even sung in the shower, let alone in a studio. <laughs> You've never done karaoke. You, did, you don't sing behind the wheel of the car. You don't know how to write a song. You own guitars. You don't know how to play guitars. You don't have a band. You don't know a band. Plus, you're 60 years old. And so I went through all of this. These are how you bring up the beliefs. So the very first step is you state an intention, something you want to have, do, or be. I wanted to be a musician. Second step is pay attention. The self-talk is now engaging. Mm -hmm. Some of it will say, you can do it. Yeah, this is a great intention. Go for it. But if you've stated an intention that is something you've not done before, or maybe not done in a long time, you're going to have fear. And that fear is going to have self-talk around it. And that's what you want to pay attention to. Because the third step is clear those beliefs. Now, when it comes to clearing those beliefs, there's a whole, as you know, I made a whole course with over a dozen different ways to clear them. And I have books on clearing them. And you mentioned Ho'oponopono, which is a way to clear them. But the third step is you have to clear those limiting beliefs. Now, had I not cleared those limiting beliefs around being a musician, you would not know that I recorded any music. I would have stopped. I would have gave up. I would have been like the average person who said, yeah, I intend to write a book, but, you know, and that'll take a while and I don't really know how to do it. And I don't have the education and I flunked English and they give up. They don't do it. And so there's no book. But if they question those beliefs and clear those beliefs and if necessary, replace those beliefs, now you can go forward and create what you want. I think you mentioned in the introduction, I've recorded 15 albums. And in fact, right now, I just recorded a new single that they're making a big fuss over. We're doing a worldwide release for it next month out of the UK. I mean, this is a major yeah. thing. I'm in the UK, just, yay! Yeah, in the UK. <laughs> and I'm chuckling to go, I was the guy who almost didn't do it. Wow. I didn't do, almost didn't do the first album. But because I hear it's the steps, step one, state an intention. Step two, note the beliefs that are coming up because you stated your intention. Third step is clear the limiting beliefs. The great news is when you clear the limiting beliefs, you accelerate your path to creating whatever it is that you wanted. You attract it faster than ever before. Why? Because the blocks are gone. The speed bumps are removed. You now have a clear path to get what you want done. I have... I, it might be 17 albums, but I think it's 15 albums that are done. I have a band that's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I have performed live on stage. I have some of my music recorded as the soundtrack for movies. I'm listed as a composer for, mu for a movie in wow. the International Movie Database. I have this single that is being released out of the UK next month. It's going to be a worldwide release. And I'm just going... <laughs> We live in a world of magic and miracles when we get clear of the beliefs for the very things we say we want. So true, right? My goodness, it's so true. And I remember writing my first book and all those things that you went through. Us, who's going to read? Who's going to care what, who I am and what I want to say? And who's going to even listen to this? And I went through, I mean, it probably years and years like that. And then one day I said, no, what's my reason for wanting to write this book? And when I found mm. my reason, I wanted to inspire people. I knew what I'd experienced. I knew what I'd learned. I knew that I'd implemented and made changes in my life. So I thought, well, that's really selfish of me if I hold it back and give myself these stupid excuses that are just not going to take me anywhere. So just do it. So I'd done it. And after that, I felt oh man so I went on to write another one and another one and it's you know and and you're right this it just starts the momentum of it gets rid of those blocks yes. um in I mean it doesn't mean I mean like as far as I've understood in my life and just through my own experiences it doesn't mean it's gonna unblock everything for you but in each thing you try and step forward in and and you want and you set your intention I suppose what you're saying is you just set those intentions and on each one you will find what bubbles up and what's stopping you, right? Yes, and clear it, clear it, question it, 
remove it in whatever bag of trick that you might have at hand, whether it's Ho'oponopono. And sometimes I find just questioning a belief, just because the belief has now come up and you can take a look at it, because you're bringing the light of awareness to it, you weaken that belief. And then when you question the belief, you weaken it even more, you get to the point where you realize, oh, I don't even believe it. You know, it's gone. When I began to be a musician and I was learning everything I could, I took a songwriting class and it was a very small informal group of four people and it was local with a couple notable um, musicians. And one of the musicians said he still had reservations when he went to go write a new song or he went to go perform. He still had concerns, but he learned to ask himself a question. And this is what I want to give to everybody. He gave me the question. I want to pass it to you because this is a great clearing technique. He said, where's the proof that mm. you can't do it? Mm. Where's the proof? So with me, with musicians, where's the proof that I can't learn to sing? Where's the proof that I can't learn to write a song? Where's the proof that I can't record an album? Where's the proof that you can't write a book? Where's the proof that you can't get it published? Where's the proof that I can't open a business? Where's the proof that I can't open my own bakery? Where's the proof that I can't find my soulmate? Where's the proof? When you ask that question, you find out there is no proof. There isn't. It's your mind playing games with you, and most of the time trying to protect you in some way, shape, or form. But when you realize that it's not true, that there isn't any proof that you can't do what you want, and it's safe for you to pursue what you want. Yeah. Now you've removed a belief and you are free to attract what you say you want. So true, right? So true. And it's so powerful what you're saying because, you know, I think so many people get stuck in that. And I know, I know that I've heard um, many people say, but I don't have the money to do it. And they may they might take that as the proof, but I don't know, like for me, I would say you don't need the money to have an idea. Right. You know, you say you just have to take those steps forward, right? And once you start taking those steps forward, people's circumstances, events start opening up for you. So it's kind yes. of walking with faith, isn't it? It's knowing, okay, when you start your book, you don't know. Um, everything you're going to write. You don't know what each chapter is going to be saying. I had no idea. I mean, I started writing the book kind of like in the middle. It didn't even start from a beginning. I started writing about the law of attraction and then I expanded from there and then put it into chapters. But I had no idea what I was going to title the book. I didn't know who, how I was going to publish it. But I think you've said many times, you don't need to know the how, do we? We just need to know we have an intention. Yes. And that's the intention. And once you have that intention, start moving forward with it. <clears throat> what, all of what you said is beautiful. So I want to pick out a couple of things to make sure people heard them. One of them is you don't know what it takes to write a whole book or to write a song or to create an album. You don't see all the pieces. You don't see all the steps when you first state your intention. But when you state your intention, you usually can see the very first step the very first step. And that's all you have to know. Because when you take that very first step, no matter if it's a baby step, it's a very innocent, easy step you can do with sleepwalking, so to speak. When you take that step, the next step becomes apparent. And you can write your whole book that way. You can re open a business and start it that way. You can create music that way. You can do everything that way. But you don't need to know it all in the beginning. And in fact, it's impossible to know it all. Life has changed anyway. Even if you made plans thinking, I'm going to go from here and 37 steps later, I'll be there. No, you won't. Something's <laughs> going to happen in life, in your life. To, it's going to disrupt those first few steps and you're going to have to adjust. You're going to have to improvise and tap dance a little bit and create a whole new path to where you're going. So it's important to realize your intention is where it starts. From the intention, you will have a clue. There's always a first step. And you always take the first step. Then be looking, okay, what do I do next? There's the next step. The other thing you mentioned was about money. And money is what people use as a form of self-sabotage. Yeah. Because they say, well, I can't do it because I don't have the money. A lot of people have achieved some remarkable things in life with no money at all. I wrote a book called The Awakened Millionaire. And in there, I said, you don't need more money. You need more creativity. Mm -hmm. 
If you can think out of the box, if you can think about accomplishing something without money, you can move towards creating what you want. Maybe money will be involved. Maybe money will show up. But if you're dependent on money as the only solution, then you have restricted your own powers of creativity and you have restricted the universe's ability to help you because you can be inspired, you can be compelled, you can create something, you can discover something that has nothing to do with money and achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. Money can come along maybe later and maybe along the way, but I don't worry about it up front. Because worrying about it up front is, it's another way to sabotage yourself. I firmly believe that most of the people who are sitting there going, oh, I would do it if I had the money. If they suddenly had the money, would blow the money on inaccurate attempts at erroneous uh, uh, deals that come their way. This is one reason why so many people win a lottery. I don't know what it is in the UK, but for That's most right. countries that I've been to, there's a lottery or lotto of some sort or another. Most people who win it for a great deal of money are more broke a year later than before they won it because money is not the answer. Usually we have to grow into having more money. And we do that by working with what we already have. We start to make our dreams come true by whatever action steps we can take in this moment. And if we have a little money to do it, then go ahead and invest in yourself. But you become accustomed to using your own courage, your own creativity, your own wits, your own action. And you're not dependent on what everybody thinks is the survival raft. Money. It's not what you need for survival. You need yourself. You need it. You also said faith. I am so much a believer in faith. Faith is the, is the miracle worker. Yes, have your intentions. Yes, take your action. Yes, believe in yourself. Do all of the things that the law of attraction and the secret teach you to do. But as you do it, have faith. Have faith in yourself. Have faith in other people. Have faith in the world. Have faith in the universe. Have faith in the law of attraction as you move forward. And that is so important, isn't it? Sorry, Melissa. Sorry, he's going to say something. I wanted to add a, a question on that, um, Joe. For those that maybe faith doesn't come easy or maybe they're struggling, especially through this time in our world where things are, you know, how they've been over the last uh, year or more. How can they expand their faith? How can they tap into <laughs> faith if that's something that doesn't come easy to them? That's a great question. What I point out to people is you're already operating from faith. You already are living from faith. The very thing that you and I are doing right now, we didn't meet before this. I didn't know what you were going to ask. You're firing questions at me. You probably didn't know you were going to ask that question. You just did now because it was based on the conversation that just simply unfolded. So you're having faith that you're going to ask questions. I'm having faith that I'm going to be able to answer these questions. And we are having faith that the whole show, which as I understand, this is live. It's on Facebook. Everybody's watching this thing. It's like when I went on Larry King both times, it was live. There's a little red light that goes on and suddenly millions of people are watching you. So you have faith that it's going to work out. We have faith that the sun's going to rise. We have faith that we're going to keep breathing. Mm. The oxygen is going to stay here. We have faith that when we get up in the morning, we're going to have whatever our work is, whatever our job is, whatever our family is, whatever our to do is, and we will go and do it. These are the take for granted faith mm. steps that most people don't ever think anything about. So I say, bring it all the way down to your life right now. You are alive because of faith. You are alive because what I ended up calling the great something, other people call God or the divine or the cosmos or the great mystery. The great something is animating us. The great something is in me. The great something is in you. The great something is keeping us going. This is where we have to focus our faith. When we start to realize that, wait a minute, I'm already taken care of. Wait a minute, my body's working, my brain's working. I'm breathing without thinking about it, without trying. When I go to eat, my stomach's going to digest it do whatever it needs to do, send it to the body parts that need the nutrients. I'm not doing any of this. Something is happening that is out of my control. I have to trust that that's working. Mm. That's faith. And then we start to look around in our lives and we start to look around and go, okay, what is happening that is actually good that we, we, we just 
dismissing it. Mm. We're just dismissing it. The very fact that we're doing this interview here, you know, I was invited. I don't remember how far back we had to put it on the schedule and everything. I didn't know anything about what this was going to be about. I know something about a law of attraction community. I haven't been to it. I don't know anything about it. I haven't been in it. And so here we are. I said yes out of faith. You invited me out of faith. We got on this call. We're having faith Zoom or whatever the technology is that we're using is actually <laughs> working for us. So when we start to break down life and look around and go, oh, my God, what's happening is a miracle. Mm. This is a miracle. Our lives are a miracle. Yeah. Our interchange is a miracle. The technology yeah. that is taking care of us is a miracle. There was a pandemic in 1918. There was no Zoom. There was no internet. There was no Facebook. We were far worse off in terms of being able to communicate than we are today. Today, we can work from home. We're doing this interview from our homes. I'm imagining you're in your homes and I'm in yeah. my home. So all of this is to say, we already have faith. When we acknowledge it and then expand our awareness of how we are being cared for, our faith expands even more. And then we can expand it to go, well, if it's already working now, how about if I do intend to open my business or intend to be a musician or intend to write my book? Maybe my faith that's already here will encircle that too and help make that work. I think those are all ways to enlarge the faith that already exists. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Like, yeah, it's like recognizing what you already have, right? Everything yes. that works in your life already, the fact that we can breathe and everything. Because I think through like what's happened over the past uh, couple mm -hmm. of years, should we say, many people have ended up looking at what they don't have rather yes. than what they do have because of what the outside circumstances is. And I suppose we're going back to like faith in that sense to say, well, okay, that might have closed down, which, which you must have faith that something else is gonna open and everyone has dreams and aspirations um, in some way or another. So I see, I mean, I think it was a really good opportunity for so many people to start something new, right? Yes. So it's like well, literally. I a year or so ago when all of this started and people started screaming conspiracy theories and that, I thought about it and I said, and I made videos saying this, that yeah, there's a conspiracy and I call it a divine conspiracy. I said the divine sent this to us because it's a, it's a worldwide time out. We are being invited to go inside. What does the, mm -hmm. the governments have all told us? Go inside, especially in the beginning, right. go inside. Well, to me, that's a metaphor. It means go inside here, not mm -hmm. just inside your house, go inside yourself. Yeah. And then I said, while you're inside yourself, this is your opportunity to meditate, contemplate, reflect, reconnect to the divine itself, the very divine that orchestrated all of this. Mm. And then I went on to say, if there's ever been a time where you said, boy, I wish I had the time to do fill in the blank, you got it. You have that time now. And it could be that, oh, I always wanted to learn Italian. Go to YouTube, go to Google. There's free courses. You can learn it at home. Or they can say, I always wanted to open my own business. Google, YouTube free information on how to open your own business. And in fact, you can do it online. And a lot of people, of course, have ended up working from home. So we found out we can do almost everything virtually. We're doing these interviews virtually. All of my speaking engagements and travel have been canceled for the last year and a half, but they've all been moved here online. And so I get to do this. And most people get to do whatever they were doing at home. And if anybody ever wanted to work for themselves or they ever thought about opening up a virtual business, Again, you can find out how to do it with YouTube and Google and then do it right online like we're carrying on this conversation now. So I said, all of this is a divine conspiracy. It's all been set up for our own good. And what I offered was a different way of looking at it. I mm. still believe we live in an optical illusion. You can see the good in the world. You can see the bad in the world. And you get to choose which side you want to look at. Both are real. Both exist, both have evidence for them. You can be a real cynic and you can go on Google, YouTube, Facebook, do all kinds of research and you'll compile the evidence to prove the world is a scary, depressing, discouraging place. 
by the same token and at the same time, if you chose to see that the world was miraculous and optimistic and people have big hearts and kindness was at the heart of everything, you can go online and you can do your research and your Facebook and this, that, and the other, and you will compile evidence to prove your case. Well, which one's actually true? Both are true. Mm -hmm. Both are, they're available as a choice. And when you know it's a choice, which one do you want to choose? You want to choose the, in a sense, the devil, or do you want to choose, in a sense, the angelic side? Mm -hmm. And so all of what I've been doing is to help people awaken to mm -hmm. our own spirituality during our physical experience here on, on the planet. And it's so important for us to actually get to that so we can live the best life possible, right? Because, you know, you like yourself, you've been on the other side where life is just doomed. You feel like life is in that doom and you just think, how am I going to ever get out of this? Like, honestly, and you, you know, it, there's times where you literally can't see past, but I know by step by step daily, like every single day by just seeing things that you can appreciate, like you was mentioning, just understanding that, look, you're breathing by yourself. You have, you have this, you like, you know, even if you don't have an actual bed to sleep and if you've got somewhere to be or something there, or there's somebody that can give you food just, or just that the sun comes out or the rain falls and the flowers grow. And these things, yeah. you know, to me made a huge difference, being able to look at, being able to appreciate and flipping that over from what I don't have and what I'm frightened of happening and what could go wrong to actually saying, well, you know what? I am healthy. I am well. I do breathe. I have got my legs. I've got my arms. I do have a thought process. I can work with my thought process. Yeah. Um, you know, there was so much that I was able to switch around and I slowly was able to see day by day more being shown on the angelic side as as you said right it was more to do with <laughs> I started to meet more people who were nice more people that had ideas or things I could like bounce people I could bounce off of rather than the ones that were keeping because I kept on attracting the same kind of people and we were all going down the same kind of road that same rabbit mm. hole type of thing right mm. until you're able to flip that over um, so yeah, I mean, I love what you said. And if we can go back to what you was from going from, um, from, you know, being homeless and being in that library to, to what was the moment for you that you realized that things had actually switched? There was, you're living something different now. What was that for you? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm thinking, First of all, I know the moment of awareness of an operating belief, the biggie that was pulling me down, was my belief that the authors I was admiring and even worshiping were actually self-destructive, suicidal, alcoholic, miserable authors in terms of their lifestyles. And so I was making my life that way because I thought I needed to, to be like them. Mm -hmm. Jack London and Ernest Hemingway have been two giant influences on my writing career. And what I had to awaken is that I can model their writing style, but not their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So when I awoke to the idea that, wow, both Jack London and Ernest Hemingway had pretty dramatic lives. In fact, Jack London was dead by the time he was 40. And both of them were suicides. And both of them had problems with alcohol. And both of them were adventurous, um, but not happy and not healthy. So when I realized, boy, I'm looking in the wrong area, I need to find authors that are healthy and prosperous and well-adjusted and happy, and when I can model them, then I'm taking on a new belief. So that was the first thing, is the wake up to the operating belief, at least within me at that time. And then when I found new authors and started to model them, things began to change. I would say, and I'm thinking back, my first book was in 1984, but my next book wasn't for 10 years. It wasn't until 1994, somewhere in there, 1993. So it was about 10 years later. And so I still struggled during those 10 years from 1984 to 1991, 92, 93, whatever it was. And I was still working on myself. I still work on myself today. 
But I think because I woke up to the operating belief and I changed it, things began to move then, whether it was the first published book or starting to get published articles, starting to get noticed by people. Um, I do know I was living in Houston, Texas in the 90s, 1990s, and I was learning marketing because my first book was in 1984 and I discovered publishers don't know about marketing. They're prestigious printers. So I had to learn marketing and my first client was me. And as I made myself more known and I made my book known, this is all before the internet, people came to me and would hire me for marketing and copywriting. And I became known, at least in Houston, Texas, for my marketing and copywriting. So there were very significant changes. And of course, more money was coming in, not a lot of win kind of money, but I was paying my bills and I was paying for uh, rent and buying a new car and, and making shifts that I hadn't had beforehand. So I would say it happened pretty quickly. But again, I didn't have Facebook. I didn't have a group like this. I need to point out that one of the secrets to accelerated success is being in a group of supportive people. Mm. This is a basic principle from Napoleon Hill. I was just filmed for a movie about thinking grow rich, Napoleon Hill's most famous book. And so I reread the book and I reread his biography. So I was prepared for the movie. And I realized that he credited a mastermind, which is a group of people supporting each other as the number one way to change and achieve success. I didn't have that. I was very much alone. I did get married during that time, but we were two very lonely, lost people just trying to survive. And so it wasn't the ideal. And I think where you, what you have going with a group that is dedicated for like-minded people is a large mastermind. And mm -hmm. magic takes place when you're in a mass mastermind. Everything gets accelerated. So it may have taken me quite a while to make these changes and see the results in physical reality. But because of the group experience, I believe it'll happen a lot quicker for everybody here. Oh, that's really nice to say. So and one of my questions was going to be about why do you think a mastermind is so powerful? But you've just answered the question because I think, yeah, we've been speaking about masterminds a lot um, because like you said, you get a group of people together and we all speak on the same language and any questions you've got, you can have answered. And it, you don't have to go at it alone because, you know, like you said, you didn't have the internet, you didn't have all the things we have today. So for you, like what a journey you must have gone through. Like, honestly, I can't even begin to fathom what it was for you. Cause I know we've gone, you know, we live our, we've lived our life and we've been able to have to a certain degree like the internet or you know going to google okay you know it still came later on in my life compared to some other people's lives as people are now born knowing how to use an ipad at like two months old they can't even open their eyes yet and they know how to use it right. <laughs> the most, uh, it's fantastic um but, but so let me say let me say something about that i was brought up in the library OK, so I did my own schooling in the library. I've always loved libraries. Today, I just create my own library. I don't have to go to the library and buy everything from Amazon or local bookstores and stock and create my own library, stock my own library. But because I was going to the library, I know how that system works. And believe me, Google is nothing more than a very fast, large library. Mm -hmm. And so I never once complained. Uh, for one thing, I didn't know that there was anything coming called an internet, let alone on Google, and know that nobody else did either. So when I'm going to the library, I remember going to the little card catalog, and you would look up books, like these little index cards you would go through. And most of my books are in the 600 decimal point area. I still know it today. And in Niles, Ohio, where I was born and raised, one of the most famous libraries in the state, if not the country, is right there. And I can walk to it. I can go there. I get the little card out and I would go upstairs and go to the little area where they had the book. All of that still happens, but it happens online and it happens like that. So when I type in something, 
Google gives me an instantaneous answer, which may or may not be helpful, depending on who paid for a banner ad to show up when I did my research. But back then in the library, it was the same thing. It just took longer because I had to pull the card out. And then I had to go walk over to where the book was and hope somebody didn't check it out. And if they didn't, pull the book off the shelf and then start reading it. So for me, I was kind of trained to be on the Internet. And I also wrote one of the first books on internet marketing because I had trained myself to be a writer. I put myself through an intense self-study course when I went to that library, the Niles McKinley Library in Niles, Ohio. I read all the writing books. I read biographies of writers. And so I was already taught to write well. When the internet first came along, the only tool we had was writing video and all that stuff we were on dial-up modems which meant it was going over the phone and, and you would listen to that little buzz <laughs> yes and it would take forever to upload your you know your email to go to somebody so i i in many ways have nothing to complain about even though you point out and you're so kind to say about the struggles I probably went through and had to go through because I didn't have the internet, I didn't have Facebook, I didn't have a group like this. And yet at the same time, I was trained for this experience. Mm. And this goes back to faith. Who trained me? I didn't know any of this was coming. So who trained me? The great something. Mm, absolutely. The great something said, Joe, you yeah. should go to the library. Joe, spend more time doing research. Joe, learn how to write. And if I had stopped and said no, Mm. said why or said no i'd rather go to a football game and drink beer yeah. <laughs> i wouldn't be here today so but true, i said right? yes yeah not knowing what was coming and it's the same thing today we all need to say yes mm -hmm. to the intuitive compulsions that are coming up that mm -hmm. feel like inspirations because i think that's the great something tugging at us saying follow mm -hmm. me i'm taking you somewhere really cool can't tell you what it is yet <laughs> but follow me and I'll surprise you later. And that's basically what happened to me. <laughs> I love that you said that. That is so powerful. Mm. And taking those steps and being open to receive that inspiration, being willing to have the faith to follow that inspiration, I believe is what is the difference between those that find success with following the teachings and those that struggle, would you say? I would absolutely agree. And I can give you a quick, but relevant and impactful story. When uh, I was still living in Houston and I was in a dump of a house and I was reading a lot of books, I remember picking up a book called the Robert Collier Letter Book, which was a book on writing. And I was reading it and in it was a mention of somebody named Bruce Barton. And I don't know why, but it just, it just crawled into my brain. And I mm. couldn't stop thinking about Bruce Barton. Now, I could have said no. I could have said, who cares? Nobody knows who Bruce Barton is. That's an interesting mm. character. And this, you know, someday maybe look it up. But it haunted me. And I started to, to do a little research in that book. And at the public library, and I learned Bruce Barton was once very famous. He had best-selling books. He was the founder of one of the largest advertising agencies in the world in 1919. And I began to get more and more interested. Now, remember, I'm broke. I'm unknown. Mm -hmm. I had the one book published 10 years before that came and went. Nobody knows about it. Nobody bought it. And so I, I have no money, and I'm living in this dump, but there's a seed planted I, I'll give credit to the great something. And it was saying, pursue this. And so I went on a quest. I went on a mission. Mm -hmm. I had to use the interlibrary loan because the little library in the community where I was living didn't have all the books. But I would walk in with a list that I had found through the decimal card system. And I would say, I need these titles. And then they would go through the other library system, interlibrary loan, find the books, bring them to that library. I'd drive over, pick them up, read them. And I went through this long quest learning all about Bruce Barton. I never once knew where it was going. Mm. Okay. Mm. Within, I don't know, six months of all this crazy research and obsession, I found out that all of his material, his diaries have been left in Wisconsin. He had graduated there. He left them at the university. I saved enough money to get on a bus to go to Wisconsin. 
when I got to Wisconsin, I realized that it was winter there and I had lived in Texas. So I arrived with a little windbreaker and froze <sighs> in the Wisconsin winter oh on a bus as I went over to the, to the college to have them pull Bruce Barton's diaries out. I don't know what I'm doing. Fortunately, none of that cost any money. I had to raise money to get on the bus, but I bring all of it back. I come back to Texas and I start to create a book. I'm just thinking, well, this looks like it's a book and I can't call it Bruce Barton because nobody knows who Bruce Barton is. But I'm following this nudge in me, this mysterious twilight zone-ish leading me down the path of who knows what. And I end up writing a little book called The Seven Lost Secrets of Success. Wow. So let me tell you the punchline. That ended up being one of the most successful books of my life at that point. Mm -hmm. A publisher who was a first-time publisher picked it up. I was on my first radio shows, and apparently I did something right on those radio shows. I remember one company of salespeople, a company of salespeople, were driving away from a conference they'd gone to, heard me on the radio, turned around, and drove to the bookstore I was at and bought copies for everybody in that company. Another person that was in a company, it was a network marketing company, bought 19,000 copies of that wow. book. 19,000 wow. copies of that wow. book. Wow. The book has gone on to numerous editions. And then, of course, after the movie The Secret came out in 2006 and I was becoming mm -hmm. even more well-known, all of my early books, including The Seven Lost Secrets of Success, were bought for more money from a larger publisher. So that is an amazing story, an amazing success, happened with no money, no clue, no evidence, no help, no mastermind, no confirmation, nothing. Only I got a nudge and I said, yes. This is what I want everybody to hear. Yeah. I feel that we all get these little they're not overwhelming nudges because we have free will mm -hmm. and free will says you can say no. I could have mm -hmm. said no. My life would have taken a different direction, but mm -hmm. I could have said no to go find out about Bruce Barton. It's like, no, I don't want to go do that. Yeah. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, I, I learned to say yes. And, and so this is what I'm saying. We all have these little nudges. They're not overwhelming. They're almost like whispers. They're usually in the mm -hmm. heart or the stomach, not necessarily. Mm -hmm necessarily up here where you think about them and when they come from here you have complete free will mm -hmm. you can say no but i have found that life is juicier yeah life is richer like, yes <laughs> life is more captivating my life is more i don't know just delicious yeah yes so exciting when you say yes <laughs> and follow those little nudges and whispers that's so powerful isn't it just you hear that everybody follow those nudges and those little yeah. whispers stop yeah. saying no to them because look i know that i'm uh through doing another certificate from you guys um was the Ho'oponopono, the advanced um certification yes. and understanding the story behind that was to me was just was phenomenal and i think wow. that's again another thing that you followed because dr hugh len um at first when you heard the story about that you was like, what, like, what are you talking about? And then right. from there, after, within time, I think a couple of years later, something happened and you revisited that. And the next thing you know now, your, um, the book from is it Zero Limits, is it the book? Yes, the very yeah. first book is Zero Limits. I've written two more after it that are sequels to it. Right. I, I wrote At Zero and then most recently, The Fifth Phrase. But the very first book that is still taking the world and shaking it awake was called mm -hmm. Zero Limits. Yes. And that's another story that you literally just had that nudge, that bit of that excitement, that curiosity. Yes. And yes. you followed it, right? Yes. And, uh, yeah. I just. Well, I tell people, follow the light. Follow mm. the light. And what I mean is the thing that lights you up. My, yeah. new, my, my new partner is Lisa Winston, who's an author mm -hmm. in her own right, has her own media show. And she's been struggling with neuro Lyme disease for most of the time that I've known her. But fairly recently, somebody told her about a kind of artistic expression called paint pouring. Mm -hmm. And she tried it, absolutely fell in love with it, and then went berserk in, in terms of, and I mean that playfully, in terms of she just got excited. 
she wanted to do paint pouring every day. In fact, she did a painting right before this call mm. and because she knew that I was going to be on a call. She didn't want to disrupt me or uh, distract me or anything, but she wants to do it every day. She doesn't know where it's going. She doesn't know if she's going to make any money from it. She doesn't know if anybody's going to buy anything later. She doesn't know how it'll expand, but I keep saying, follow the light. Mm. And that means follow what is lighting you up. It is lighting her up to do that. When I heard about zero limits and I heard the story that the most amazing story, that a therapist helped heal an entire ward of yeah. mentally ill criminals, but without actually working on them directly by doing some mysterious offhand technique. It was like, if, if, the, if this is true, then the world needs to know. Yeah. That's what sparked me. That's what got the light going. And as you know, I, I did research. I found the man. I did workshops with the man. We did three workshops together. We wrote the first book together, Zero Limits. And all of it is, of course, true. And it has been changing lives since I released that book in 2005 or whenever it was. So, but again, it's following the light. And it's not anybody else's light. It's your light. The whole Bruce Barton thing. When I was reading the Robert Collar letter book, Robert Collier was already dead. That book had been already out for decades. And so lots of other people read the book. They saw the same thing I said, but either no light came on for them or they said no to it. Yeah. I got wow. a light and I said, yes. Mm. And that light led to, without me knowing it, the seven lost secrets of success. Wow. Thank you for saying, for saying yes to the light because- Yes. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> from everyone Honestly. all over the world that you have touched, Dr. Joe, God bless you. And we are eternally grateful from everyone everywhere that you've touched. We all send you so much love and gratitude. Honestly. Um, really, um, our lives did a complete turnaround because you said yes to the light and followed your path. Mm. Um, that's so powerful. It's such a blessing and a gift that we can come together and exchange energy together and empower each other. And as we each say yes to the light and honor that call to come home to ourselves and go within and discover those things that light us up, even if it's painting, like I totally resonate with that. I love to paint and there's something about creative energy that just helps you feel alive and excited. Um, we'd love to host Lisa someday on the show, on here oh, as well. <laughs> That'd be amazing, yeah. absolutely. For yeah, sure. Absolutely, and I think also, you know, a good example here is following the light. I mean, you know, when I decided to reach out, I just, you know, people could say, oh, Dr. Joe won't, you know, he, how, as, like, as if he's going to, like, respond, he's not going to respond, <laughs> but you did, and I was just like, how, and it took all of, like, literally, I think the first email I sent, um, I think you replied back after two days, but I think once we got to, I think the second email I'd sent to you, that was, we were redoing the dates on it, because um, you wasn't available the first time round, it was within three or four minutes you replied, and I was like, <gasps> And that was me sitting, lying on the sofa, and it must have been about two o'clock in the morning for me. And I just got this thing inside me and just said, email you. And I just, and I went, mm, it's two o'clock in the morning. Okay, just do it. it. You know, and I could have said, oh, it's two o'clock in the morning. I can't be bothered. Like I need to go to bed, but I didn't. I felt it inside me. And mm -hmm. when, you, when, I, when you responded so quickly, I realized that, that was following the light for sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. So um, I know you've put together um, three of your best law of attraction courses. And I'm really excited about this because yeah. I, I love, and Melissa, we, we love your courses. I mean, I've taken so many of them. <laughs> it is like, um, so yeah. And I know that to help finally help people uh, make the law of attraction work for them, right? Focusing on four, three core areas. And I think the most exciting part about this is that you're doing it for only three dollars. Like, thank you. Like, thank <laughs> yes. you for what you, a gift honestly. For the members. <laughs> what a gift. Thank Amazing. You. Honestly. Well, I, I, I've done my best to take away all the excuses. And yet at the same time, I've learned that I have to charge something because I give away a tremendous amount of things for free. 
Mm. And a lot of people don't indulge themselves when it's free. They don't respect it if it's free. And so I thought they have to put a little skin in the game, um, but not a whole lot. I know what it's mm. like to struggle. I know when it's like to not have enough. So I thought $3, $3, and I'll give them three entire programs on the law of attraction and not skimpy programs. This is the best of the best. Yeah. Wow. For example, one of the programs is called the three day rule. And I'm very proud of it because basically it's saying that what you're thinking and what you're feeling will generally be attracted to you in three days. So if it doesn't happen, oh, yeah. and so when it doesn't happen, what's going on? And so the course is all about knowing the science behind attracting what you want as fast as three days, because we're thinking so many things all day long, but generally we keep changing our minds. Mm -hmm. Even to go back to the early part of our conversation, if somebody said, oh, I want to be a musician like I did, but their next 50,000 thoughts are, I can't do that, or all the yeah. reasons why it won't work out, they're not going to manifest it in three days. They're going to manifest what they believe, which is it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so one of the courses is called the three day rule. Another one of the courses, and this is, I think this is really my contribution to the success literature of the world. I'm calling it the missing secret. I really feel that one of the reasons people try different things, whether they watch The Secret and then they said, oh, I tried it and it didn't work, or they tried the law of attraction and said, oh, I did the visualization, but it didn't work. I think it's because there's a missing secret. And the missing secret is the awareness that we talked about earlier, that we are operating more from our subconscious and unconscious beliefs than from our conscious beliefs. The error that most people think is, if I just sit here and believe it and affirm it and visualize it and meditate on it, it'll come about. Well, if you don't have any counter intentions or any negative beliefs, it'll probably come about. You still got to take action. But I have found that the missing secret is you have to remove the negative limiting beliefs. When you do then you can attract what you want. There's no interference. There's no blocks. Everything's been taken away because the thing that was in the way wasn't on the outside. It was on the inside mm -hmm. and it was the limiting beliefs. So I have three courses and the three day rule is one of them. Missing secret is another one. And I already forgot what the third one is, but all three of them. Money loves speed. Oh, money loves speed. Oh, we have to remember that. But money loves speed is my entire course on attracting money. And I'm quick to point out, it's nothing about real estate or investing or buying stocks or banking. I don't know any of that stuff. This is all about your mindset. Mm -hmm. And I talk about eight laws, eight principles of money. One of them is money loves speed. And mm -hmm. it is an important lesson. All yeah. of the ones need to be taken because when people just absorb this, they will start to attract money because, again, they're going to remove the limiting beliefs they have about money. And when they do, they're free. I was homeless. I was in poverty. Today, I live the lifestyle of the rich and famous and get to do fun things like hang out with you two and everybody at this in this particular group here. I mean, how thrilling is that? So Money Loves Speed is the entire book and me reading the audio version of the book for those that don't want to actually read. But all of it, all of this, plus there's a bonus worth about a thousand some bucks for three dollars it's wow. at zero limits method.com zero limits method.com excellent this is amazing like dr joe vital i am so thankful so grateful to have you like honestly i don't think there's words there is a no, word that can explain no words. It, right, Melissa. There is, it's like there is words but there isn't <laughs> words it goes deeper than that just thank you so 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 much for being here like thank honestly you. you've made our dreams come true for sure yeah well, um, dream bigger i'm gonna dream even bigger <laughs> now we are <laughs> <laughs> you are thank you both thank you both for inviting me you're both charming i love the interaction all the energy of course i can't see everybody that's in the group but i i love you all we're all we're the ones that are making a difference we're the ones that are bringing light to the world so we need to shine bright and i'm wearing my expect miracles shirt to remind everybody that's the mindset to have not expect crap to happen expect no. miracles <laughs> to happen yeah have a absolutely. choice Focus on the positive. So thank you all and Godspeed to all of you.
Uh, thank thank you. you, Joe. We love you, you so much. And your Expect Miracles inspired our um, closing statement that we are expecting great things with and for you all, always, and always sending love. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> thank Take you. Care. God bless you.